the What's the American, American Academy of Sleep Medicine has suggested 8 to 10 hours for proper brain rest. And you guys know that's impossible if you do a 50 hour work week, right? And then you have to take care of kids on top of that. But uh, that that's a, that's a nice goal. I don't know if it's practical. Um, definitely nothing less than six. Less than six, and most of us have pushed the envelope, I'm sure, even in college. I remember, I don't need to sleep more than three hours. I can do it, just give me a cup of coffee, I'll take my test the next day, but the brain will always suffer in due time. I think anything less than six is a problem if you're gonna continue with it for long, because you're gonna have to reboot with something in the daytime to, take, to offset the, the hours. Uh, I, I like seven to eight for my guys that exercise. Eight to ten is a little bit too much, but I, I think if you can shoot for seven, that's, that's good. Seven hours straight of sleep. And it doesn't include waking up and pacing. So seven hours straight of dip down sleep, downtime is, I think, in most studies, pretty decent as far as total REM. It also depends on how fast you get into REM. If you're getting, to, and that's the other thing, because I have a lot of patients that say, I sleep from 10 to 6, and I don't wake up, but I'm so fatigued. I didn't put a slide here, but sometimes if you go, this is the way the brain works. Slow wave, slower, sleepy, deep sleep. Stage one, stage two, stage three, four, REM, back to stage one. So it always goes like that. Some people will be stage one, stage two, stage three, stage one, stage two, stage three, one, two, three, they never hit REM. And if you do that, you can sleep all night, but if you don't get any REM, the brain will not be able to calculate the next day, converse, in meaningful conversation, the dexterity will be off. Because again, you're, you're robbing REM sleep, which is what a lot of the benzodiazepines do, the Valiums, the Halcyons do. They'll make you sleep, great. And you look at the alarm clock and say, wow, that's fantastic, I feel good. But you'll still be sleepy because the brain didn't get the rest it needs. Supposedly that REM or about stage four is where cells repair, DNA replenishes, and it gets rid of all those little junk pieces of DNA and the brain is rested, the neurons in the brain rest. So, there, unfortunately the research is a little limited as far, the hard research is a little limited as far as what exactly happens during that time, but the, the sleep, American Academy of Sleep Medicine has been able to say that if you have this amount of sleep and it's REM, you will feel refreshed, because a lot of people will say they feel refreshed. So I would always shoot for about seven hours. So there's, there's a way that you can hold this stage four, you know, how do, you, how do I know I'm stage four? Oh. Uh, good, in the well, good question. Uh, the question of how to know uh, someone has entered stage four. Well, no, we don't want to, uh, I don't mean to uh, have you look at sleep on a scheduled basis. That's it, the, the scientific methods that uh, I, I try to show you are just to give you an idea about how to understand the disease process. <coughs> I think just like food, if we think of food as carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, you're taking the luxury and the love of food away. There's a lot of great things with food that are outside the concept of macronutrients. And same thing with sleep. If we divide it into stages all the time, we'll be too obsessed with trying to hit the stage that we take the joy of sleeping away. I think if you just set the environment and let the brain do what it has to, as long as there's no big diseases, big cancer or tumor or out of control diabetes, if you set the environment for sleep and do the five senses or try to stimulate as much of the five senses as possible, the brain will take over on its own. It will enter one, two, three, four, REM, five, one, two, three, four. It will enter on its own. It might take a while to reverse, especially if we've had 10 years of chronic sleep problems, but um, the true way to answer your question in a short uh, uh, sentence, the true way is to get a sleep study and watch your sleep study. That's the only way to really see if you're going through stage four or REM. But you don't have to. If you feel pretty refreshed and you went seven hours straight, the likelihood is you probably hit REM. If you're feeling unrefreshed and fatigued and you hit constantly seven hours straight for 21 days, either you're not hitting REM or there's another problem occurring, another disease that has to be looked into. Remember, sleep is only one of the cogwheels in all, considering uh, the whole human. There's other things I just like to talk about sleep because it's so easy to change, I think. And if you change one of the little spokes of the wheel, the others will usually follow soon. So try to shoot for seven. And if you can, and if you're still feeling unrefreshed, that's when you talk to a doctor or a sleep specialist. How, how much did the uh, stay for last few minutes? Well, usually about uh, the average cycle between one, two, three, four, factor one is about 90 minutes. 
and you're supposed to enter REM four to five times a night, average human being. Uh, so you can accumulate close to uh, one to two hours of REM. That's probably a lot. Uh, I think that's if you're really lucky. Um, but again, it weighs a little different. And sometimes when you are jet lagged, there's something where your brain will actually catch up. You sleep, oversleep the next couple of days and it'll catch up on REM and reset everything. So the brain has a great way to function, just like cancer fighting. If you give the body the proper nutrients, I really believe, and, and grounding and movement, I really believe that the cells can fix their own DNA if you give them the proper environment. Yeah, even cholesterol, if you give, Dean Ornish's work with uh, heart disease, if you, and, and prostate cancer, uh, if you give the body group therapy, proper nutrition, yoga, exercise, it usually will reverse if it's early stage, or, or heart disease, it's usually reverse on its own. So I really think the brain is a great organ and those neurons can fix themselves, but most Americans are really 50 hours a week, poor diet, too much alcohol, too much caffeine, and no grounding whatsoever. The majority of my patients, and the, I think the majority of people going to school have no idea about what grounding is. Meditation, uh, except for if you're being told to sit in a corner and sit there by yourself and be quiet. Then you have no choice, you have to be quiet. Or when mom says, time out, go in that room and stay there. And if you have no internet, you gotta think to yourself and imagine and dream. And that's when you start to relax. The only, I, I think that why men like golfing so much is because you're on a course, even if you're talking, talk, you're on a course, you see blue, you see green and trees, it's kind of nice. And I think it's the, without thinking, it's a nice way to get out to nature and relax. But we're not taught that component, so. Thank you. Here. Okay, uh, <clears throat> I know you said it's on the internet. I'm just kind of wondering, what about just following the breath kind of pause? Is that a good way to do it? Where you're just kind of noticing? Oh, yeah. Um, okay, good question about just observing the breath instead of doing a breath awareness meditation. Well, technically, that is a meditation in itself. The idea of breath awareness meditation, or BAM, breath awareness meditation, is that, um, and it comes from yoga, when you start to focus, I, I learned this from Herb Benson out of Harvard. I went to one of his courses uh, many years ago. and. He has such a practical way to get into meditation, more so than Deepak or Andy Weil. And he just says, concentrate on a word, sound, phrase, or prayer, repeat it over the course of five to ten minutes, and just keep on doing it. If you repeat the phrase, sound, word, or prayer, then you keep on going over and over and over. Every, eventually, if you do it for five minutes, the other things in our environment are washed away. Instead of me paying attention to that, how bright that light is, or those people moving over there, or the cars flying by, which I can interpret all that at the same time and read this. But sometimes for those of us who constantly pay attention to that, our attention will be put there. If you are attending your breath and observing your breath, the breath will go in and out, in and out. There's a fluctuation if you just watch your breath that it actually is hypnotizing. Just like sitting on a beach and listening to the waves crashing in, it's very relaxing even if you're not a beach person sit in the shade, but you want to still be there. What are we looking at? We're looking at the water. You're looking at the water come in, you're looking for some, like, some seagulls, but well, it's kind of relaxing. And I think it's because of the harmonic beat of the earth and nature. Same thing with the breath. If we go back to, that's part of my hiking for health lecture, but if we go back to uh, something as easy as that, whether it's heartbeat of mom or the <coughs> breath that we're doing, it takes you out of the cadence of society and puts you into something natural and eventually slow brain waves come on. Even if you forget, was I thinking about, because we'll often wander. Um, Richie Davidson out of University of Madison talks about mind wandering. It's a form of meditation where you go from one thing to the next thing to the next thing and not try not to hold on to it. And you kind of relax that way. He says a lot of us do it anyway. Whereas the mindfulness will actually get you a response, a serotonin response, relaxation response. Supposedly the DNA works better, uh, less of the anti, less of the inflammatory markers in the bloodstream. So, I think yes, uh, in, in a long-winded way, I think just observing the breath is an exercise in itself, and that will work. The prevention that you focus on, on just the exhalation, or you do it on anything else? Uh, with regards to no, oh, uh, in the relaxation response, Herb Benson just talks about concentrating on the word, sound, thought, or prayer. He doesn't really relate it to the breath. That's up to us. Oh. And even 
Deepak and David G that are lecturing now, they'll tell you it's up to you if you want breath in, to breath out, to not even worry about breath and just thinking about your mantra. Uh, it's whatever the person wants. As long as you get into some repetitions, repetition, mantra, is mind training, mantra, mind training. So you keep on getting that instrument going to train the mind into relaxing and forgetting about everything else. Because that could be a deadly thing. If you go into mind wandering, especially if you have anxiety, mind wandering will take you from one topic to the next topic to the next topic, you will not stop. So that could be a problem. That's why I like mindfulness better. But they both work. Yes? Two questions, because that one just sparked a lot of thought. Dr. Andrew Weil has the relaxing breath, or seven eight breath. What is the purpose of the over seven? A good question. So in uh, Andy's uh, 478 breathing, why do we hold? Uh, I've asked him that before. Uh, I actually have it taped on YouTube too. Uh, in yoga, typically it's through the nose, not through the mouth, except unless you're cooling. And it's usually in-breath, out-breath, in-breath, out-breath. There's no pause. Andy likes the pause because they're mechanically, if you have four, seven, and eight, you can see the phases occurring. And it's easier to link back to the same thing. It's easier to link back. The breath typically is not supposed to be a breath. Most people will learn to hold breath and make it a Valsalva maneuver. If it's a gentle pause, I like to call it a pause when I'm uh, getting my patients to meditate in my yoga class. If you hold your breath and just wait, like a roller coaster, about to crescent and go down, they'll give you a tangible, uh, I think it increases oxygenation. I think there's some oxygen that transfers in the lungs and there's still this dead space where you can still transfer even after that breath in and you, you exhale. I think if you hold it, I think there's more oxygenation that occurs, it's personal. But uh, I think it also gives you a tangible schedule of what to accomplish. And also to, the seven I think it makes, in an esoteric sense, well it gives the brain a tangible, here comes eight, eight is coming and then back to four. So I, I, he's given me a kind of a, that kind of a nutshell of an answer. I like the way he thinks, and I think mechanically thinking, it's easy for an average Joe off the street to learn it. Instead of imbibing in that, going to Herb Benson's stuff, or going into Deepak Chopra's uh, books or seminars, it's really easy to just think four, seven, eight. I think it's very Western, if you ask me. But also, of all the breath med meditation, uh, breath awareness meditations I have. All my patients just love 478 because it's tangibly, okay, it's easy, 478. Don't have to worry about mantra. I have a lot of patients who are religious or Christian that don't want to do mantras because of uh, whatever fear there is. So it's, I think it's very neutral. I got a little hung up in the you know, four, seven, eight. Oh, okay, okay. Trying to think what's the purpose of seven and eight before, you know, is there a reason he picks four, seven, eight? Oh, I see what you mean. The, the eighth part, uh, Theoretically, the expiration is supposed to be when you relax. That's why you want it longer. Inspiration is fast and quick. And, and, and if you look at physiology, you can really fill up your lungs quickly. If you, you can also fill up your lungs, fill, empty your lungs quickly too, but that will really re rely on something forcible. If you let it go slow and smooth over <coughs> double the inhale, then usually, is, again, it instills or brings out relaxation. That's my theory. So, good question. My second question. Sorry, it's okay. That, um, what if you're a night owl and you prefer to go to bed at one or two and you don't have to get up early for work? Is that okay? Like, is your circadian really going to be all screwed up and you go to bed at 10? Mm -hmm. You should have to bed at one or two and still so catch your seven hours and got up at seven or eight. Good question. So, the question about being a night owl and going to sleep later and waking up later, it would go, away, go against following the sun and the moon because the sun stimulates and the moon relaxes uh, as far as melatonin. It will go against that. However, I think it's better than nothing. If you get deep sleep, if you go into REM, my, my personal thought is if you can get deep sleep, go into REM during that seven hours, even if you're waking up later. Because a lot of my um, moms that now have kids that are going into daycare, they drop, either they drop them off or somebody else drops them off and they can sleep later. Or summertime, kids can sleep later. Um, parents can sleep later. So I, I notice it, and I think it's acceptable. As long as you have the REM, then it's okay to push the time clock back. It, in Ayurveda, it's a no-no, because Ayurveda, or the science of healing in, in Indian medicine, specifically says, no matter who you are, which culture you're at, you're supposed to stick to 10 to 2 and go to sleep at a certain time. Going by um, uh, astrological or farm, uh, like the Amunite, you're supposed to rise when the sun rises and go to sleep when the sun sets. 
So you might be away uh, in the uh, true spirit, you might be away from the, the spirit or the harmony of the earth, but in practical sense, if you have to, I think it's worth it as long as you're feeling refreshed. And as long as you continue that for at least a month straight. If you do that for two weeks and then you go back to normal, somewhere between the two you're going to be hitting the wall and you have to catch up or make up the difference. And it could be, if that happens to be during high allergy season, you're guaranteed you're going to get sick. Because if you want to fight an allergy properly, or if you want to be prepared for taxes, you have to get set for the stressors that are coming. If you also make that change with your sleep at that time, that's two stressors already that you're adding to everything else. If you're trying to make, go through a detox and you're going to try to switch your sleep at that time, wow, that's two big stressors during a detox when you can technically just have one. So I think sleep is undervalued and I think it's abused uh, a lot and I think that we kind of chew over it when it can really change around the way we fight the disease, the way we uh, react to normal medicines and the way we um, conspire together. Good question. Yes. Uh, I'm a psychologist. I'm just wondering if you would concur with me. a couple of things that I just want to make mention for everyone in the room. Sure. Um, the bedroom is supposed to be just for uh, sleep or sex. And, uh, and TV, I don't know if all the research is in, but I saw some local Fox News that, um, especially an hour before bed, but all these kids who are watching TV, especially at night, screwing up the sleep cycle. Yes. The last thing is about sugar, and you would agree that sugar is a stimulant. Definitely. I agree on all points. Let's go over those points uh, one at a time. So, uh, sleep with regards to um, visual. <clears throat> not only does the light from a computer or television, not only is it stimulating, but the content of what you're seeing. Your average talk shows, what, 22 minutes, not including the uh, commercials? They're made to make you stay with them. Even some of those ridiculous, uh, like Jersey Shore, those sitcoms or whatever they are, uh, they make you want to have some emotional response. Typically, when I watch these things, I can't wait to turn them off because it really brings up anger in me. I'm thinking, what? Even the news in the morning brings up anger. So news at night, 10 o'clock at night, it can incite an emotional response. So I think it is stimulating. I think cable TV is terrible because you can watch a you can watch a video, uh, what do you call it? a music video, and suddenly you want to dance or something, and that's not the right time to do. It. So it's it's very stimulating. I think uh, the our creative guys and the advertisement guys are really good. So I would say stay away from TV. I don't like watching TV at night. I don't like being on a computer at night unless I have a project or something. So uh, definitely kids, even on the iPhone, you'll see them. My daughter has a tendency to get in the iPhone. I, I tell her to try to turn it off, put it away, and, and calm down the day. Because kids especially, if they're, they'll tweet these ridiculous things. I'm, I'm sure it's very cool social stuff, but they'll tweet the most ridiculous things that incite a response to this whole community of people. And that'll, then you want to wait for the next response, and it's something you know. So it's very stimulating. The temperature definitely, I think, uh, brain waves go stay slower when it's cooler temperature. And I did have one slide on the glycemic index. Processed food is made to taste and also give you an emotional response fast. So if you have, um, well, just talk think carbohydrates. If you have pasta al dente, chewy pasta, which is supposed to be like that, like in Italy, chewy pasta gets you get your muscles going. It takes a lot to digest that. So that slowly, once you eat it and swallow it, slowly gets released into the bloodstream. Versus super soft macaroni and cheese. You eat that, it almost immediately is into the bloodstream. High, high sugar spikes. With a high sugar spike, uh, this is from several topics, uh, a couple of topics ago. High sugar spikes will tell the brain, I'm flooded with sugar, time to put it away. So insulin secreted. A high amount of insulin, it's called an insulin dump. And usually when an insulin dump occurs from the pancreas, it forces all the sugar in the cells. And usually it forces sugar into a very low amount. So usually within about half an hour to an hour, you become hypoglycemic, you get crabby, irritable, and then cortisol secretes. So you have the swing of emotions that's not good for sleeping. It does not set up for slow wave sleep and relaxation. It'll be one trauma, insulin dump, after another trauma, cortisol dump. So bad foods at night, definitely. So foods, and that's where you can sometimes fool the kids. If they eat late or you have a third shift or a late worker, a second shift person that comes home late, if they have to eat, all right, throw fat, I mean healthy fat, like omega-3 fish oil, throw fat or Metamucil or something with fiber into the meal. And a cheap thing is to 
get Metamucil. If you get a wafer or a Metamucil powder and you throw it into your meal, it effectively, even if it's a processed food dish, you effectively would change something called the glycemic load of the whole plate. It all sits in here. You can slow down the absorption so that hopefully it gets re it released into the bloodstream nice and slow and doesn't instill insulin dump or cortisol dump. So if you have no choice, try to think of things that will you can mix in that will slow down the absorption. But yeah, I totally agree with you. Yeah, uh, some of the criteria for sleep disorders comes from the DSM. Uh, DSM is the Diagnostic Manual Sleepy manual. manual, yeah. Uh, it's, it's the Bible for uh, psychological and psychiatric disease. And it has sections, big sections, in sleep, uh, for sleep disorder. Uh, so, good question. Anything else? Well, you, nobody fell asleep, so that's kind of good, so you must be getting good sleep. Please, I'll have this on, uh, if you haven't, uh, if you want a copy of this, I'll put it online. Just leave me your email. I, uh, or if you don't want to, just check out slideshare.net. And you'll usually see Dr. Rick, um, D-R-R-I-C, on the search engine for slideshare.net, and it'll be um, getting to sleep. I'll put it under that. I have I can't release it until I'm finished my next. Uh, I'm doing another lecture in in Wheaton, or not Wheaton, in um, uh, Bikram Yoga in Naperville. It's, it's free too if you want to think about it. So I'll release the the slideshare after next Saturday for those of you who want to review it. And if you have any other questions, you can always email or try to contact me in my office. My uh, business card is there. Otherwise, everybody have a good sleep and a good day. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks. Are there yoga classes online too? Are they posted? Uh, I was. It was too hard for me to. I did one. I did a summary of one and then pulled my breath. But oh, 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 I'm sorry. As far as the schedule. Uh, Northwest Community, only on Northwest Community Hospitals Wellness Center um, uh, schedule. I don't. I, it's really at this point. I'm just doing Monday class at noon. It's a meditation, so I do five minutes of meditation, and then we go into very almost like a Yin Yoga type of movement. Uh, I, I think that's where I you can probably find it. You know, if you live in the area, I found five yoga studios in the area, and all of them will offer first class for free. You can kind of test them all. That's for the most gentle yoga they have. All right, sure. Thanks for coming. Yes, I think I think the, to satisfy a lot of our.